Good morning. Uh, today's scripture reading comes from uh, John chapter 11, verses 32 through 36. Let me find them here. Sorry. I must be blind. Okay, here we go. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. Thank you, Caleb. I get the privilege of uh, introducing the speaker this morning. And we've had a great weekend um, uh, meeting with his family and uh, with Alan and Melissa and, and Luke and Maddie. It's, it's been, been a wonderful time. And um, so, you know, the thing is, when you have a speaker come in, you always ask them, you know, what do you want me to say, things of that nature. And a lot of times I'll hand you something, okay, I went to school here, I've done this, I've done that. And I ask, I ask Alan, he says, I'm just going to preach, and, you know, just whatever you want to do, you know, and I love that, you know, because he's not worried about, you know, this is who I am, because he's just going to bring us the word of God, and so uh, the one thing that I will share with you, if you haven't seen it, and it's, it's uh, his conversion, um, and it's very moving, and one thing that, you know, when he was baptized, and when he came up out of that watery grave in baptism, he thought it's time to preach, and now what you, he was like, okay, I'm preaching next Sunday. I'm baptized. I got to promote the word of God, you know. I love that. And that's the excitement that we all should feel. You know, almost each and every day we promote the word of God. I'm not going to take any more of his time, but it has just been a wonderful weekend. I've really thoroughly enjoyed them, uh, both Alan and Melissa and their children, a great family. If you haven't met them, please introduce yourself. Get to meet them a little bit as we fellowship and eat. Um, and uh, before I take for anything else, Alan, if you'll come, come on up here and take this over so I don't get started and get going. <laughs> Asked Brian last night, we had a dinner together at Tom's place. And I said, uh, you guys gamble here? And I, he goes, what do you mean? I go, is, is like a card okay to show for as a slide before my sermon? And he was like, well, if you bet on Alabama, you're going to lose every time. I go, okay, that's enough. <laughs> All right. Well, just so you know, my daughter gave me a My Little Pony sticker for good luck. So <laughs> here we go. So the text uh, we just read a moment ago about the death of Lazarus and from the book of John is a, a very important text to kind of understand the text that we're going to today for our sermon. Uh, if you don't know already, Jesus had some very close friends. James, John, and Peter are his three closest disciples, but also he made friends of other people as well, believe it or not. Uh, and Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, they're all siblings, are also good friends of Jesus. And you can tell from the passage we just read, uh, he did die. And the sisters were convinced that if Jesus were there, that he would not have died. He would have stopped that death from happening. And when Jesus came upon the scene and he realized what was going on and he comforted the sisters, uh, they were still in the process of grieving and mourning their brother that, that was died and that was three days ago. And when Jesus got to the tomb, after he had cried over the death of Lazarus, he brought him back from the dead. And because he did that, he had a lot of people that believed that he was the Messiah from that point forward. So... Our text today is going to be a little bit after what we just read. It's in the book of John chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. We're going through 11 verses today. I'm not sure what you're used to, but 11 verses is not a whole lot for me. Uh, so we're going to take our time and slow our pace a little bit, and then just kind of let this text unfold before us. Um, I have one habit. When I read the Bible on my own personal study time, uh, I read it too quick. I just read it so, like a novel. I just read through the word. I'm like, yep, got it, got it, got it, got it, move on. I have to force myself to go back and read slower because if I slow down and I let the words just unfold and just show me what they're really there for, things pop out on the second reading that they don't pop out on the first. 
And so what I want to do is read through the text in a somewhat quick way and then go back into the text and talk about what we just read. Does that make sense? Okay, you with me? All right, if not, we're still moving. So here we go. John chapter 12, verse 1. Then six days before the Passover, I'll pause right there and for context. This is the Passover we're talking about, six days from this point where he begins the Lord's Supper memorial feast. So that's kind of a timeline for you of where we are. We're in that last week. Okay, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who, uh, who was, had been dead, or was, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointing the feet of Jesus and wiping his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And he said that not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and he had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, Leave her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial, because the poor you have with you always, but me you do not always have. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death, uh, to death also, because on, him, um, because on account of him many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So again, this is a pretty important scene. If you just read through it, you don't slow down to let it really unfold in your mind of what this must have been like if you were there in their sandals, then you really miss a lot of the nuance here in the text. So Lazarus died the previous chapter. Jesus resurrect him. We're now in the final week before his betrayal, arrest, and burial, and then the resurrection after that. But when we look at this context, these 11 verses, there's just so much going on. I mean, the atmosphere, the social room is just completely full. And one thing I want to emphasize before we go back into the text and kind of see what we can extract from it is one significant point about God and, by implication, also Jesus, who knew the hearts of men. Over in 1 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 7, in that context, you have King Saul over Israel, and you have Samuel, a prophet and a judge, who's been told by God to go and anoint the next king of Israel to take the place of King Saul. And we find a man named Jesse who has a bunch of sons. And all the sons appear before Samuel, and he goes one by one to see if God's going to select him. They eventually get to the young shepherd boy, the youngest, King David in the future, and he was anointed king over Israel. But one very important thing here, 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. As Samuel is going down that line, seeing if God wants the older brothers of David to be king, no, 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 no. You can imagine Samuel being like, these are all perfectly good options. I mean, Jesse's a good guy. He's got some good sons. So what's the problem here? 1 Samuel 16, 7. The Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. Because the Lord does not see as man sees. Because man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. It's a very key thing to understand. Because when you read about God and you read about Jesus, it's not really their stories that we're so interested in. When looking about the life of Jesus, we don't really get a whole lot of personal information. Don't know how tall he was. Don't know what kind of beard he had. I know he had one. Don't know if he was good looking or unattractive or normal or whatever. We don't have any details about who Jesus was. The closest thing that we can kind of get to realize who he was and his personality was by looking at the people that were around him and how he interacted with them. When you see the people that are around Jesus and how he interacts with them and how they interact with him, you get some idea of who Christ is all about. 
So in this particular passage, John 12, 1 through 11, we've got a plethora of options of different heart conditions surrounding our Lord one week before he knows he's going to pay for everyone's sins. It's a very tender moment. He's in the home of three of his best friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who he just resurrected from the tomb, and now they're having a meal together, a common meal. So let's jump back into our text and look over at John chapter 12, beginning in verse 2. The very end of our beginning context, Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, there uh, they made him a supper. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. If we're looking for an individual to focus in on and see what their heart is all about, uh, I'm going to focus on Martha for a minute. So we look at Martha's heart, and we've known a little bit about her. If we jump back into the book of Luke chapter 10 just for a moment to get some idea of what we know about her, we don't know a whole lot, but Luke chapter 10 verse 38 Now it happened as they were at a certain village that a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. I'm sure you guys are familiar with this story, hopefully. You have Martha, who's busy in the kitchen. She's preparing a meal for the Son of God, of all people. And here you have his posse with him. And she is concerned that she won't have enough mashed potatoes to serve Jesus, right? That's the story, right? Maybe I added some detail. It's maybe not there. But hey, here we are. But Martha was distracted with much serving. The Greek there for distracted is pretty interesting. It's kind of like your psyche is full is the kind of word picture there. So your mind is, is full. Have you ever had a full mind before? So much going on that you're just all over the place? I'm sure we've not felt that way at all the last two days here. All right? <laughs> We're just distracted with much serving. And she approached him, Jesus, and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Let's give her a little bit of grace. I'm sure she was overwhelmed, to say the least. But her walking over and talking to the Son of God and saying, don't you care that I'm the only one preparing you a meal? is a little bit, you know, not that important in comparison. Therefore, tell her to help me. Son of God, command my sister to help me in the kitchen. Okay, Martha, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. There's enough mashed potatoes. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. Now, I'm going to make a terrible joke here. You do not have to laugh. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Does that ring a bell? I told you you didn't have to laugh. Okay, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. That's absolutely right. But one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. She's busy and distracted and worried about many things, but they're not the main thing. Because Jesus is in her living room teaching the word of God, and she's worried about mashed potatoes. (laughs) Priorities, okay, priorities. So when we look back into our text of John chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, keep in mind what's just happened in her life. She knew Jesus. Huge deal, apparently, right? The Son of God. She knew him on a first-name basis, it would seem. Trying to command him to get Mary to help her in the kitchen, they were pretty close. Jesus was away doing his work. Lazarus got sick. Lazarus died. And then later, Jesus shows up. And he, she basically says, where were you? <laughs> I mean, we needed you, and you were away. Martha was a bit nicer in her grieving. Mary was a bit harsher because she was grieving for her brother. So Lazarus now has been resurrected. And that's been a huge weight off her shoulders, but a huge shock to her emotional system. She's all over the place right now because her brother was dead. She was grieving him, and then he just walked out of the tomb one day because Christ was there. The whole lot of process, right? 
So here is the Passover, or here's six days before the Passover, and she wants to prepare a meal for her brother who was dead and now is alive at the dinner table, right? And then Jesus is there. And so what is she going to do? She's going to serve. It would seem like that's what she could do at the time. A whole lot going on in her life, but she did what she could. We don't hear any complaints from Martha this time about Mary being busy. Martha's just doing what she can. And so if we're looking for the hearts in the room, because he's the king of hearts, the first heart I see there is one of a servant. Sometimes in life we are overwhelmed. We are distracted. We have a lot to process emotionally, and we don't know what to do. So what do you do then? For Martha, we do what we can. And that's fine. That's all that Christ required of her at that moment was do what you can. If we're jumping down in the text a little bit to verse 3, to verse 3, Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. We all know what that smells like, right? Anointed the feet of Jesus. That's the joke. Okay, don't have to laugh. And wiped her feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. So again, to kind of in your mind set this picture up, we read through it quickly. You, no doubt you missed the details like I have. Uh, you've got Lazarus there. Big deal. You've got uh, Martha who's serving. This is a big deal for her. You've got Mary now showing up, who the one was sitting at the feet of Jesus, and now she just breaks open a flask of oil and starts wiping his feet with her hair, and the room is filled with that fragrance. There's already a lot going on in this room. It's just supper, right? But a huge, huge deal here to slow down and get all these details. This seems to be the same account recorded in Mark chapter 14, verses 3 through 9. So let's turn there and read that one. It's a few details that are either not included in John, or John just forgot about them, or he didn't think they were important enough, but Mark got them in there. Mark 14, verses 3 through 9. When do I stop? When I'm done? Okay. Okay. <laughs> And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, so it would seem that we're in a, not their own prime residence, as he sat at the table, a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Sounds familiar. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. New detail. But there were some who were indignant among themselves. I love that because it's so strong. Full of rage and fury. They're just having dinner, folks. And here Mary comes along and breaks this oil and dumps it on his head in a symbolic gesture of anointing one, which, by the way, the word Christ, Christos, or Messiah from the Hebrew, means the anointed one. So Mary gets it, right? That's, that's huge theology right there that she is getting. She's anointing the anointed one. But they were full of rage and fury, indignant among themselves, and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? Don't miss it. Here you have Jesus. You've got Lazarus. Martha's busy, as she is. Mary comes out of her room and dumps this oil on the anointed one's head. Six days before the Passover meal where he knew the guy he was sharing the oil and dipping the bread and the oil with was going to betray him. And she sacrifices this costly oil. It's perfume, cologne, right? To anoint him in this moment. They, the people that were following him, probably just Judas, full of rage and fury said, you wasted that oil. No, she used it on the Messiah. Okay, back to our text. Because, here's how it's wasted, it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. If that's still Judas from John chapter 12, he's like, I could have had 300 denarii if I just stole that from the poor. Uh, for some idea of what that would have been, uh, denarius is what you would get for a full day's labor if you were a blue-collar worker, we would call it today. And so this is approximately a year's worth of salary, if you want to call it that, that this oil costs. So not cheap, right? 
Take what you make a year and then extrapolate that to you just bought something and broke the flask over Jesus, his head and no doubt his feet, wiping his feet with your hair. That's what she did. And we call that a sacrifice. So you have the servant, Martha, as she does, doing what she can. you got Mary, and she is full of sacrificial love. She wants to show the Messiah, I get it. I know who you are. I know who I am in light of who you are. And this is how I'm going to show you my love is sacrificing this item that I've purchased with over a year's worth of salary, no doubt, and I'm giving it to you. This is my sacrifice. We keep reading in our text in Mark to kind of get the full context. Jesus said, leave her alone. I hope we said it nicely because it's scary to read out loud. <laughs> leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me because you have the poor with you always. And whenever you want, to, uh, whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me, you do not have always. She has done what she could. See a theme? She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Now, I don't know how I would have received that over dinner. <laughs> it's a different dinner conversation I normally have. But there's a whole lot in work here. Christ knows where he's going. He knows who's going to send him there. And he knows these people in the room are not ready for that news yet. But he's trying to kind of soften the blow of what the, the gospel would look like. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And guess what? We just did it. He was right. You tell this story, you talk about her and what she did. Don't care about Judas and how he stole money from everybody. Don't, don't really care about that. But we care about what's, what Martha and Mary did to show their love to Jesus while they could. All right, let's jump back to our text. John chapter 12. Verses 4 and 5. We have servant, sacrifice, maybe we call them stingy to be polite. All right? Verses 4 and 5. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And, they, and he said uh, that not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and used to take what was in it. I can only imagine what his mindset was like. I don't really get him at all. I mean, he was called to follow the Messiah, and he did. And we see him being the one who ultimately would betray the Messiah as prophesied. The one who dined with me would betray me. That would be him. And we see him now being the treasurer. If you've got a treasurer who's skimming off the top and you're working with God's son, you think you'd be more clever than that. But I guess, I guess it was too tempting for him. Over in Mark chapter 14, we see one more motivating factor behind him. Mark 14, verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad because they're looking for an opportunity and promised to give him money. So he sought how he might conveniently betray him. This was right after the events of our text, by the way, in the chronological uh, exposition of the actual text of Scripture. When we see these little glimpses into the heart of Judas, it's vile. You've got a guy who's walking with the Son of God a place of privilege and honor, and yet he's just looking out for himself. That's Judas, and that's unfortunate, but that's the reality. So you've got the contrast here of Martha serving, doing what she can, Mary sacrificing, doing what she can to anoint his body for burial. Then you've got Judas over here, gabbing off, complaining that he can't steal that 300 denarii he could have sold that oil for. And that's all around Jesus here, a week before his death. And then finally, we look into our text, John chapter 12, dropping down now to verse 9 through 11. 
But Jesus said, leave her alone. She's kept this for the day of my burial because the poor you have with you always, but me you do not always have. Uh, now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. So they were now keeping tabs on him. And they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed Jesus. So that was their plan. The guy who died and Jesus brought out of the tomb, their big plan was, we'll try it again and see if he stays in the tomb. If it didn't work once, I mean, Christ is still there, right? It's a terrible plan. Let's go over now to uh, John chapter 11, just a couple of verses before our text. John 11, beginning in verse 45. This will give us a small glimpse into the heart of Jesus, into the heart of those that didn't know that he was the Messiah or didn't want to know. John 11, verse 45. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things that Jesus did believed in him. That's the resurrection of Lazarus. But some of them went away, to the, went away to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus did. And the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do? Interesting question, by the way, if you know Acts 2 and verse 38, 37 and 38. What shall we do? Because this man works many signs. If we leave him alone like this, Everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. Ah. Look back into the Old Testament, the major and minor prophets specifically. What you've got is God giving the Spirit to a person to go and tell the people what God said. Right, A messenger, an ambassador, if you will. They're a prophet, the, the bubbling up ones, literally, from the Hebrew. So the ones that are so filled with the Spirit, they can't help but speak what God tells them. And so you've got these prophets, and they go and they give the message. Sometimes they perform a miracle like Elijah would, for example. And we've got these individuals seeing the miracles, seeing the message. They see the miracle. They say, oh, this guy's from God. Let's do what he says, or if not, it's our peril. That's the whole message, right? And so now you have the Jews of the first century they should have been like those of the Old Testament. Because now they're saying, this guy is performing some crazy miracles. We ought to listen to what he has to say because he's from God. But instead, again, our verse, if we leave him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away our place and nation. We are important, not him. We know he's from God, don't care. It's all about us. One of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one should die for the people, and not the whole nation should perish. Now this he, uh, he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad us by the way and then the next verse then from that day on they plotted to put him to death and therefore jesus no longer walked openly among the jews and then we have our text john 12 where you have judas speaking up from his stingy heart looking for a chance to betray him conveniently these two goals aligned so you have martha Serving, doing what she can. Mary, sacrificial gift to anoint the body of Jesus before his betrayal and arrest. You have Judas, a stingy heart looking to make an extra buck. And then you've got the Jews that are here that are spiteful of his position of power from God, looking for a chance to arrest him and to put him to death. The main point is when we look into that text and you just read it, I go, yeah. Okay, I get it. You get a room, it's a dinner, some folks are there, things are happening. All right, not the, main, not the most important text in the world. We're getting towards Passover. But if you slow down a little bit and kind of examine the room, 
You see Jesus at the center, as he always is in Scripture. He's at the center, but look at who he surrounds himself with. You've got Martha doing what she can. You've got Mary going above and beyond, sacrificing a costly oil to show him that she gets it. You're him that we've been waiting for, and this is for you. You've got Judas. Oh, Judas, doing what he can to get what he can. And then you've got the spiteful Jews looking for Lazarus to put him to death again because surely that will work the second time. And then you see Jesus in the middle of all of that drama, all of that situation. The main point I want you to take away from this particular examination of this text is that Jesus knew all of their hearts. When John wrote this, it wasn't a surprise to Jesus that he knew who was around him. He knew the hearts of men. So he knew what Martha was doing. He knew what Mary was doing. He definitely knew what Judas was doing. He knew what the Jews were trying to do. And there he was, examining their hearts as the king of hearts and letting them choose their own path. When it comes to us, folks, in a sense, we're all kind of in a room, aren't we? I can't read your heart. I don't know what's going on behind those eyes. You could be here fully intent, fully focused, or you could be somewhere else because something in your life is not going the way that you'd like it to. You know who does know? Jesus. He knows what you're going through, knows who you are, knows what your motivations are, and knows everything about you more than you know yourself. And that's okay. He allowed Judas to be in that room. He allowed the Jews looking to kill Lazarus, his friend, to be in that room. He also allowed Mary and Martha to be there. He all gave them an opportunity to be around him and to have their hearts read and revealed. And so this morning, as we're gathering together to worship him in various ways, and to be together in a communal way to worship him, to learn more about his word, my question is for you, what kind of heart do you have right now? I won't judge you based on it, because Jesus didn't. He allowed them to exist and to be around him, but some of them had consequences, and some got rewards. And so for me... And for you, knowing that Christ is at the center of this room with so much going on, how much more does he want to be in our lives with all that we have going on? This morning, if anyone has a need to respond to the invitation, if something in your life is not right before God and you would like assistance in figuring out how to be in a fellowship with your creator, if you're going through something and you are distracted and worried and busy about many things, if your brain is just full, let us know that we can pray for you, support you, comfort you as a family in Christ. If anyone has a need for the invitation this morning, you can come forward now as we stand and we sing.